Hello, good friends. My name is the Twikeen, or you can call me Alex, whatever you like. And welcome to a very special video at a very special time of our lives. As you can tell in the title of this video, I'm going to be counting down my top 25 favorite video games released during the decade of the 2010s. This decade was definitely a life-changing experience for me as I was not only stepping into a new set of games released, but also inspired to try out some I would not have even considered thanks to YouTube and the many content creators who make really great videos about them. The way this list will work is quite simply featuring games that were released between January 1st, 2010 and December 31st, 2019 in a top 25 list. I will also be including each game's North American release date, although in some cases it will also be a simultaneous worldwide release. What went into my selections were some typical considerations like gameplay and the experience. This list, however, will not include remastered titles such as the Zelda remakes on 3DS and Wii U, because all those really are are just graphical and gameplay improvements with almost the same experience from its past console release. The games on this list are ones that are completely new and sometimes revolutionary. I will admit a few titles on this list will include talking about its sequel at the same ranking too, as it felt more like an enhanced port than a definitive sequel. You'll see what those are as we go along this list, but let's not waste any more time and get things started for the countdown. Hope you're ready for some surprises. We're gonna first start things off with a list of honorable mentions. These are games that I really enjoyed playing this decade, but just missed the cut for the top 25. Instead of ranking the honorable mentions, I will instead list them by their North American release date chronologically. Super Mario Galaxy 2, released on Wii, May 23rd, 2010. Super Mario 3D Land, released on 3DS, November 13th, 2011. Zelda Skyward Sword, released on Wii, November 20th, 2011. Mario Kart 7, released on 3DS, N December 4th, 2011. Zelda A Link Between Worlds, November 22nd, 2013. Yoshi's New Island, released on 3DS, March 14th, 2014. Super Smash Bros. for 3DS and Wii U, released on October 3rd and November 21st, 2014, respectively. Pokemon Shuffle, released on 3DS February 18th, 2015. Mario Party 10, released on Wii U March 20th, 2015. Celeste, released on various platforms January 25th, 2018. Mario Tennis Aces, released on Nintendo Switch June 21st, 2018. The Liar Princess and the Blind Prince, released on various platforms February 12th, 2019. And Yoshi's Crafted World, released on Nintendo Switch March 29th, 2019. And those are my honorable mentions. Now let's get the real ball going, guys. What do you say? Number 25. Street Pass Me Plaza, released on March 27th, 2011 for 3DS. Alright, I'm sure all of you guys are like, what? But this is one of those games that gave me one of the best experiences this decade. I'll start off by saying that I bought my first 3DS in July of 2013 and didn't know much about Street Pass for about a year until I've seen Nintendo Direct videos about things you can get when you tag someone else's 3DS. Then when I went to some local gaming hangouts in my area such as a Smash Brothers for Wii U demo at a Best Buy, I brought my 3DS with me, put it in my pocket, and received dozens of tags for things such as Puzzle Swap and Find Me. While those were really nice ways to get some tags, the experience of that went to a whole new level when I went to the PAX East video game convention in 2015, and I got several hundred, if not a thousand, tags, which helped me even more 
for collecting puzzle swap pieces. I finally completed all the puzzle swap pieces for a moment at PAX East 2016, and it fulfilled my experience really well. The only mini games I really played were Puzzle Swap, Find Me 1 and 2, Slot Car Rivals, Ninja Launcher, and Me Trek. I still have yet to 100% those other games, but they'll come in due time, pretty much as long as the 3DS doesn't badly die in the 2020s. So that was Street Pass Me Plaza, a game that was a really fun experience when played so many ways and at so many places. Number 24 Mario Party Island Tour, released on November 22nd, 2013 for 3DS. This title should come as no surprise to people who watch my channel on a regular basis, but for those who haven't, I'm pretty much a diehard Mario Party fan as I've played almost all the titles in the series. This was my first ever 3DS game that I started playing on its release date, as I was torn between getting that one and Zelda A Link Between Worlds, which also released that day. I just wanted something with replayability for a while as I only had just a 3DS and Wii system in my house, but not a Wii U at that time. Anyways, on to the gameplay. The board playing aspect, while lackluster at times, is still not that bad. It just felt nice to have an on-the-go Mario Party released on a more superior handheld system. Multiplayer play can be done using the 3DS's built-in download play mechanic, and there's even a board where you must have 3 to 4 human players to play, which I only got to experience once at the PAX East 2016 event while waiting in line for a panel. Most of the minigames have portable play in mind, such as using gyro controls and using the 3DS's touchscreen. The single player mode Bowser's Tower is also really cool in its own way, as you have to climb up 30 floors of minigames and having to fight a boss every 5 floors. I always felt like trying to set all kinds of records and challenges for myself when playing this Mario Party. This title also packs in a Street Pass feature where I can take on random opponents in minigames for some party points. And that's Mario Party Island Tour, one of the most favorite pick up and play games, especially for a handheld system. Number 23 The NES Remix series. Released as NES Remix on December 18th, 2013 for Wii U then NES Remix 2 on April 25th, 2014 for Wii U, and then Ultimate NES Remix on December 5th, 2014 for 3DS. Alrighty, here we go. The first of a few games on this list that consist of a series that feel like the same kind of experience playing. This one is definitely a great example. I'll start by saying when I saw a preview of this in a December 2013 Nintendo Direct, I felt really excited to try out classic NES games as if they were ROM hacked. I still had to wait about a year to try it out though as I still didn't have a Wii U yet, but I got my first experience with the series with the 3DS version. I'll get to that one in a bit. Anyways, NES Remix 1 packs in dozens of classic NES games with certain rapid-fire challenges, and finishing them as fast as possible. The Remix portion is where things really shine, such as having Link play the Donkey Kong Arcade, or using Samus in a Super Mario Bros. level. Its sequel, NES Remix 2, felt most like the first iteration, only with NES games not used in the first one, plus a couple new modes including Super Luigi Brothers, which involves playing the Super Mario Brothers game solely as Luigi and moving in a mirrored direction. The other mode is a championship mode to try racking up a high score, which would also be used in the 3DS version. Speaking of the 3DS version, it contains some of the titles featured in both NES Remix 1 and 2, with the same challenges as before, just in a more portable setting, and it also included online leaderboards for each challenge, based on time cleared as well, as assigning a random challenge on a daily basis. A couple other modes for Ultimate NES Remix are Speed Mario Bros., which is the original Super Mario Bros. game played in a fast-forward motion, 
and the other mode, which can be unlocked after clearing every challenge with three stars, is the ability to unlock a new game called Famicom Remix, which has the same games and challenges but with them in Japanese. The differences in that may not seem like much, but the sound effects for a few games have different sound effects from their American counterparts, which makes it more fun and interesting. I can tell as the years went on afterward that this game can be easily forgotten after clearing everything in it, but I had an unbelievable blast playing a game with this magnitude of challenges, and that's the NES Remix series. Number 22 Mario Party 9, released on March 11, 2012 for Wii. I can already tell some of you must be going crazy for me including this notorious game on my list, but it does have its moments of sheer joy and other things. The biggest reason people call this a notorious game is that it shifted the Mario Party series into a direction highly disgraceful with the car mechanic. I don't like it as much either, but when I've played so many boards with down-to-the-wire finishes, I've been liking it more and more. Anyways, the concept, unlike the first eight Mario Party games released, involves riding a vehicle with your opponents and collecting these things called mini-stars, which can be obtained by moving through certain spaces on the board, playing mini-games, and other wild and crazy things. Quite simply, the player with the most mini-stars is the winner, aka the superstar. Besides the board play, the game is stacked with a few fun modes too, including a single-player story mode, and minigame modes that involve many different ways to win. One cool new mode is the Perspective Mode, where you can play some minigames from a near first-person perspective. After all, we've played minigames from a high camera look, now see how it looks from the actual perspective of the character you play as. I think it's an awesome challenge if you ever get a chance to try it out. So that's Mario Party 9, definitely one of the more controversial selections of games to put on this list. But like I said earlier, this is my own list of games that I have really enjoyed and I shouldn't have to have like a carbon copy of someone else's list anyway. Number 21 Pokemon X and Pokemon Y Released on October 12th, 2013 for the 3DS Probably the first decent selection of this countdown. A little backstory first. I didn't play any kind of mainline Pokemon game since either Gen 1 or 2 before playing this one. Definitely the biggest reason I got into this one is because it was just after the time I became a first time 3DS owner and kept seeing tons of trailers and buzz on Twitter about it that I should give it a try and I had an epic blast indeed. I haven't played it as much lately after beating the champion but it made for great memories after getting myself back into the Pokemon franchise for the first time in quite a lot of years. I'm not going to go over the plot of the game as it could be spoiler heavy, but I'll mention that playing with something like Pokemon of Me was another thing that really got me a more engaging mood to play the game and give my Pokemon a lot of encouragement. And that is Pokemon X and Y, the game that made me a casual Pokemon fan again after over a decade. Number 20 Puyo Puyo Tetris Released on April 25th, 2017 for Nintendo Switch and PlayStation 4 and other platforms too. I'm gonna point out that this was the first game I bought for my Switch especially as that was mere days leading up to, the, to this game's release. I felt really excited for this one as it combines two franchises I have tons of experience, although maybe not as much for the Puyo Puyo side as I played a similar game called Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine many years ago. I'll start off by saying the story mode of this game is really well put together as it features a wild and crazy plot and makes you play some various modes. The modes include standard Tetris play, standard Puyo Puyo play, Fusion, which combines both kinds of pieces into one match. Swap, which makes you, like it says, swap modes on the fly. And Big Bane mode, where you place pieces in a fixed spot as many times in a row as possible. All those modes definitely add a lot of intrigue. The biggest thing that made me proclaim this game as my 2017 game of the year is the ability to play matches online with friends or randoms. 
as I played over a hundred hours of this game online, I knew right away that this would be my perfect one-on-one -on -one game instead of Smash Brothers, because I just seem to have better instincts at Tetris than trading hits in Smash. The online play also gives you a global ranking too, which I find fun and exciting to try and improve on almost every day. And that is Puyo Puyo Tetris, a game with a pretty addictive online mini or multiplayer mode. Number 19. Mario Party Star Rush, released on November 4th, 2016 for 3DS. Wow, already the third Mario Party game to crack the top 25. This is a title that to me contains the most variety of stuff to do, or even just try out. The biggest spotlight for a mode is Toad Scramble, which lets you move Toad around a grid-styled board, winning minigames, collecting stars, and even some Mario series characters as partners. Other modes include Balloon Bash, Mario Shuffle, Rhythm Recital, Boo's Block Party, and the Challenge Tower. But my most favorite is Coin Athlon, which makes me move around a circular board and move a space for every coin collected in minigames, which makes this mode treated more like a race to complete a set number of laps against opponents. The minigames in that mode are well put together to make for a fun competitive race. That's all I'm gonna say for Mario Party Star Rush as I don't want to take up too much time discussing the game that has a ton of variety. But overall, a really solid addition to the series, even though it's not as faithful as the old school games. Number 18. Donkey Kong. Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. Released on Wii U February 21st, 2014 then ported to Nintendo Switch May 4th, 2018. This game in the Donkey Kong franchise to me has a great atmosphere of levels and music to soak into, as I've been a fan of a few Donkey Kong games growing up. The premise of this game is pretty similar to a game that preceded it called Donkey Kong Country Returns, only this time DK and his three companions Diddy, Dixie, and Cranky must make their way back to their home island after an invasion by the antagonistic Vikings called the Snowmads. A few things this title improved upon the Returns game was adding two new characters I mentioned earlier in Dixie and Cranky, and adding secret exits to levels, which to me feels like a nice trade-off to only having six worlds, or rather islands, to play on. One of the funnest experiences I've had with this game, even though I haven't done it myself, is watching it being speedrun at AGDQ 2015 and the runner using Cranky for most of the levels, showing off how broken Cranky is with his cane being used as a pogo stick. The levels are very colorful and fun to play, especially with crazy levels of difficulty, and this one world that can give you Lion King vibes. When completing a level, you are also entitled to try out a time trial run of that level to get a fast time, but you can also submit your times to an online leaderboard, which gave me ideas to try it out. I'll say I highly prefer doing the minecart levels, as they have a near fixed amount of speed, and it's up to you to enhance it in a way that can be effective. Before I move on, I should point out in the Switch port that Funky Kong was added as a playable character, and he has movesets that make him probably more broken than Cranky, such as Infinite Rolling. I've yet to try out Funky, but I probably will at some point though. And that's Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze, one of the most colorful platformers out there. Number 17. Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Released on Nintendo Switch December 7th, 2018. Oh my, where to start for this one? I guess I'll say that my fandom for the Smash Bros. series has died down a bit as its fans have been heavy beggars for character inclusions and millions of weird speculations. Just wanted to get that out of the way as that's one reason why it's ranked that low on my list. Anyways, the game itself feels very solid with the fighters already included. The biggest thing this title improved on was bringing back an adventure mode that the 3DS and Wii U versions lacked that is about as intense as Subspace Emissary from Smash Bros. Brawl called World of Light. In that mode, which I still need to complete by the way, 
you run across the board with so many different branching paths along the way and releasing some fighters to unlock as well as releasing these items called spirits that are considered a substitute for trophies from the previous games in the series as they were difficult to make for this game according to the game's director Sakurai. The spirits are definitely a great way to give hundreds of game franchises a chance to shine in the Smash Bros. series. The game also comes with DLC fighters which will continue to be released after this decade concludes, but that doesn't stop me from including this game on this list as it plays solidly and has great ways to pay homage to all kinds of characters and franchises. So that's Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, a fighting game with great fighters, music, and modes. Number 16. Yoshi's Wooly World, released on Wii U October 16th, 2015, then ported onto 3DS as Poochie and Yoshi's Wooly World, February 23rd, 2017. I had to include this game because it's just too adorable. The platforming and brain teasing this game brings are what makes it so much fun. Anyways, the game starts when almost the entire Yoshi population gets broken up into rolls of yarn, and it's up to main man Yoshi to rescue his friends and stop the chaos caused by Kamek and Baby Bowser, or Bowser Jr., whatever he should be called in this game. A few other things that make this game so much special is the kind of Yoshis that get knitted back together, especially based on the theme of the level you cleared, such as Blizzard, Hot Cocoa, and Watermelon. And Yoshi can also don costumes of some famous Nintendo characters by tapping their respective amiibo figures, which makes things more fun to play. Now I'll talk a bit about the 3DS port. That one contains all the stages from the Wii U version, plus some stages from just for Yoshi's companion Poochie. I'll say that it's not as fun as advertised because I feel like it has broken hitboxes to collect beads. Another thing that makes the 3DS version broken is Poochie Pups, which jump out to suspicious spots of hidden secrets. I'd rather stick with the Wii U version as it's just in better picture quality. And that is Yoshi's Wooly World and Poochie 2 if you want to be more technical. An adorable game with lots to see and explore. Number 15. WarioWare Gold. Released on 3DS August 3rd, 2018. Alrighty, here we go. I had this one as my game of the year for 2018. This game is still really fun to play as it encourages me to improve my records from time to time. Anyways, this game is like a definitive edition of the WarioWare series which contains many returning micro games and modes from other games in the series. The thing that makes these micro games so much fun is that they only require just some quick reflexes which I feel like I excel at really well. The story mode of this game does a great job of setting things up for everything else the game has to offer. The best thing about story mode is that the characters, known as Wario's flunkies, have fun and hilarious cutscenes with voice acting, something the other games didn't really have. There's so much content packed in this game that I don't have time to go over it, unfortunately, but it's one you should try for yourself if you haven't yet. And that is WarioWare Gold. Number 14. Super Mario Maker Series. First game released on Wii U September 11th, 2015, then ported to Nintendo 3DS December 2nd, 2016. Then the sequel released on Nintendo Switch June 28th, 2019. And here is another entry on the list that involves multiple games on the list that play roughly the same, despite a sequel. I first got so much excitement for the first game when it was first announced during E3 2014, as it was like a groundbreaking moment for the Mario series. This game gives you the ability to create your own Mario courses in a large number of ways, as well as play courses created by millions of other players. A few key features that I will mention about the first game is that it gives you the ability for NES Super Mario Bros. levels to put in something called a Mystery Mushroom costume, which allows you to change Mario into hundreds of different Nintendo characters or other cool things. Some of those costumes can be unlocked using an amiibo figure and by clearing a 100 Mario challenge, which involves trying to clear 16 courses with up to 100 lives. In the sequel for Switch, 
the 100 Mario Challenge got revamped to Endless Mario with a more limited amount of lives, but a nice trade-off of trying to clear as many courses as possible. The sequel also included more improved course features such as slopes and setting challenges like collecting X amount of coins, finishing the course with a certain power-up, or even not getting hit. This one also included a really nice story mode with courses designed to help rebuild a castle, and those were a blast to play. One more thing that was included is online multiplayer, but I'm not going to talk about it much because it was a disaster for the most part, as lots of people had bad internet connections. And yes, the first game also got a 3DS port, but I never played it since courses can't be uploaded in it, and I never really cared for it much anyway. So that's the Super Mario Maker series, a revolutionary way to play Mario courses, undoubtedly. Number 13. Puzzle and Dragon Z plus Puzzle and Dragon Super Mario Bros. Edition, released on the 3DS May 22nd, 2015. I'm willing to make a big bet that this is a long forgotten game on the 3DS. The first I heard of this was in January 2015, as there were initial rumors of it coming outside of Japan, and I decided to keep a close eye on it for a few days. Then during a Nintendo Direct that many days later, it showed up and rumors were true. I first played the mobile version of the original Puzzle and Dragons and it was pretty fun, but playing it on my phone wasn't much fun as using my finger to slide orbs just wasn't my thing, so I eagerly waited for it to come to a better kind of game system to play it on and the 3DS is just perfect as I can easily use a stylus. My first hands-on experience with this game came at PAX East 2015, where there was this large demo booth for it and I had a ton of fun playing it. This game has the second most amount of hours played on my 3DS with about 170, which is about 40 behind my most played 3DS game that will appear later in the countdown. Anyways, I rambled on way too much with the experience factor I had with this game bundle, and I'll go ahead and talk about it. This is a two-in-one piece of software. One lets me play Puzzle and Dragons in its more traditional setting, with Z at the end of its title. The Z game takes place in a world filled with monsters that can be collected and be powered up with attribute colored orbs to defeat other monsters. As you go on the adventure and defeat bigger boss type enemies called Sky Dragons, pieces of broken land can be put back together in the style of putting a jigsaw puzzle piece in place. The monsters also come with unique skills such as attack and defense raised that can be activated with a certain amount of skill points at your disposal and can evolve just like Pokemon can too. Now for the one most of you probably wanted to hear about the most, Puzzle & Dragons Super Mario Bros. Edition. This game plays about the same as Z as you would expect, but a few key differences include using one of those skill things only after a certain number of turns have passed. A leader of your team can only be a form of Mario or Luigi, and your helper better known as an assistant leader, can be either Mario, Luigi, or other big-name characters in the Mario universe like Peach, Bowser, Rosalina, Toad, and Yoshi. Anyways, the Mario edition of Puzzle & Dragons is played in the same style as most traditional Mario adventure games, traversing through eight worlds to rescue Peach from Bowser's grasp. But a more fun way to do this is gather up Bowser's own minions, such as Goombas, Koopas, Hammer Bros, Cheap Cheeps, Lakitu's, and even the Ice Bro. If anyone who watches my channel knows why I mentioned Ice Bro, you are a true fan. Plus about a hundred other variations of enemies. Like I said about Z, monsters can evolve and they can too in the Mario edition, but in cool forms such as the Goomba evolving into a Goomba Tower, a Cheap Cheap into a Cheap Chomp, and hundreds of other wacky combinations. Oh my goodness, I hope I didn't bore you all with this one, because I had a lot to talk about for this game, considering the amount of hours I put in. Anyways, that was Puzzle & Dragon Z plus the Super Mario Bros. Edition, a game that will take you a very long time to complete, and that's no joke. Number 12. Donkey Kong Country Returns, released on Wii November 21st, 2010, then ported on 3DS as Donkey Kong Country Returns 3D, May 24th, 2013. This is a title I'd never heard of till I saw it in stores the month it came out. Growing up, I've been like the biggest fan of the Donkey Kong Country games, and they have 
great platforming and music, and I was so excited for its grand return after so many years. I'll first of all admit that I had so much trouble getting used to the platforming in the early days of its release when I played a demo of it at a GameStop that I just gave up on buying it. But all that changed in the summer of 2013 when I began to watch YouTuber Slim Kirby's playthrough of the game, and once I got a general idea of how to play it, I decided to finally get my own copy. But my first copy was the 3DS version, which does play really fine with a few differences from the Wii version, but I'll get to that in a bit. Anyways, the premise of this game is to play as Donkey and Diddy Kong in an adventure to save their bananas from the horrible Tikis, who have also hypnotized the animals in the jungle. The courses have tons of variety, just like the original Donkey Kong Country games for the Super NES, such as General Platforming, Barrel Blasting, Minecart Riding, and the newest one called Rocket Barrel Blasting. As you progress through the levels, not only has the ability to collect con letters returned, but also a new challenge of trying to collect puzzle pieces, which can unlock pictures for the game's gallery. Now in the 3DS version, there is the ability to play an extra world as long as you have collected all orbs from con levels, an extra heart for damage, and a few extra cranky shop items such as a green balloon to prevent falling into pits. I've given both versions about some equal time as they're both really fun to play, and that will about do it for Donkey Kong Country Returns. Number 11. Super Mario Odyssey, released on Nintendo Switch October 27th, 2017. As this is a game that is undoubtedly on tons of lists such as mine, I wish I didn't have to explain much about this one, but I have to. The first time I saw this was during Nintendo's January 2017 presentation about the Switch, and Mario Odyssey was among the list of games showing off, and I felt pretty excited to see the initial trailer for it in a metropolitan setting of New Donk City as well as other really nice sandbox type places. The main objective of this game is for Mario and his newest companion, Cappy, who has taken over as Mario's new hat as it was torn up pretty badly by Bowser, who has yet again kidnaps Peach, and tries to get a wedding arranged for themselves to collect po power moons used to power up a new mode of transportation called the Odyssey. A couple things that make this game very enjoyable is that thanks to a nice sandbox setting, Lots of moons can be collected in any order at any time, and the ability to play as 2D NES Mario in a few areas of nearly each kingdom. The music for a few kingdoms are really outstanding, such as Fossil Falls and Jump Up Superstar sung by Pauline, who makes a triumphant return to the video game scene after being primarily used in the original Donkey Kong arcade game. And that's all I'll say for Super Mario Odyssey, a really enjoyable Mario experience. Number 10. Tetris 99, released on Switch February 13th, 2019. Ah yes, my game of the year for 2019. This version of Tetris is definitely unlike anything I've ever played, especially as you're going up against 99 other people in an online setting. A few things that made this game stand out from other Tetris games was continuous updates and events to make the game more and more fresh such as the monthly Maximus Cups to try winning my Nintendo Gold Points, and new background themes based off of other Nintendo games. I don't have much else to say about it, as it still plays like a typical game of Tetris, but no doubt that it will continue to receive new content and events into at least the early part of the 2020s. And that is Tetris 99. Number 9. Fortune Street released on Wii December 2nd, 2011. And here's definitely my 2011 game of the year, although I didn't start playing it until early 2013, when I first started seeing copies of it in stores and wondered why I'm seeing Mario standing alongside these kinds of characters I've never seen or heard of on the box art. As I started looking more into how the game is played, I noticed that it has a style very similar to Monopoly, which got me even more excited. Anyways, this game packs in a whopping 18 unique boards, each set in various locales from the Mario and Dragon Quest series of games. Each board can be played with one or two roll sets called Easy and Standard Rules. Easy Rules is all about trying to buy shops and trying to connect a row of them together to increase their value. The one thing that separates Fortune Street from Monopoly is instead of buying houses and hotels for each property, 
is to invest capital to make that property more expensive for your competitors. And in standard rules, you'll have a set of shops already connected to try and build value, but also comes the ability to invest stocks to increase your net worth even more. This game also gives you the ability to customize your Mii character with costumes and other accessories from both series of games, which definitely adds some personality to your experience playing this game. And that is Fortune Street, a game in my mind, the most superior version of Monopoly. Number 8. Captain Toad Treasure Tracker, released on Wii U December 5th, 2014, then ported on Nintendo Switch and 3DS July 13th, 2018. Some of you may have wondered where this one would end up. I wish I could rank this one slightly higher, but of course there are just some games better. Anyways, this game has to be up there as the most charming of the decade. It is basically a spin-off of the Captain Toad courses from Super Mario 3D World, which was released a year earlier. The game starts off with the titular Captain Toad and Toadette going up a platform to collect a superstar only to have it stolen by a giant bird named Wingo, as well as Toadette who tried to take it from his grasp but was unsuccessful. So it's up to Captain Toad to set off on an adventure to rescue Toadette from the clutches of Wingo, and takes on various courses all with the challenge of no jumping as he carries a heavy backpack. Each course comes with a task of trying to reach a power star at the end as well as collecting gems and completing other side objectives, which definitely adds more replay value to this game. There are courses that can also be completed by Toadette as you get further in the game as well. Now I'll say a few differences between versions released. In the Wii U version, after you complete the main game, you can unlock courses from Super Mario 3D World, or play them from the start if you already have 3D World save data, which I never did unfortunately, as I only had my Wii U for just a couple weeks, thanks to the release of Smash for Wii U. Then in March 2015, an update was applied for the game to work with a new newly released Toad Amiibo, which gave you the ability to find Pixel Toad somewhere on the stage, who is a scoundrel by the way. In the 3DS and Switch versions, instead of Mario 3D World courses near the end, you get to play courses from Super Mario Odyssey. Then in February 2019, an announcement was made for DLC of the Switch version called Special Episode, adding in even more courses, which made me push this game slightly higher in my ranking than I had earlier in the decade. A free update was also applied to allow two-player co-op in courses. And that is Captain Toad Treasure Tracker, easily the most charming game of this decade. Number 7. The Jackbox Party Pack series, released every year since 2014 on many platforms. This one shouldn't need that much explanation. Quite basically, it is a series of games that give you the ability to play games in a setting perfect for parties or get-togethers, especially in a live stream setting too. Best thing is anyone can play as long as they have a compatible device such as a computer, tablet, or smartphone. All that is required is to go to the site jackbox.tv and input your name and a four-letter room code. I don't have much time to go over every single kind of game made for the whole series, but I'll just name a few of my all-time favorites, which are Trivia Murder Party, Earwax, Fibbage, Joke Boat, Gespionage, and many more. And that's the Jackbox Party Pack series, a series that will no doubt be supported for a long time coming after this decade is over. Number 6. Animal Crossing New Leaf, released on 3DS June 9th, 2013, then rebranded as Animal Crossing New Leaf Welcome Amiibo, December 8th, 2016. I'll be honest, I knew absolutely nothing about the Animal Crossing games till about 10 years after the first one on GameCube was released, and I was watching YouTuber Madame Wario's videos of the games that gave me some inspiration to give it a try. The GameCube one didn't appease me that much as some things looked weird and I had a hard time understanding the concept. But when New Leaf came out, I got more intrigued to try it out as I was seeing dozens of screenshots of it on Twitter in the first month that I knew I had to finally get myself a 3DS and play it. In this Animal Crossing game, playing the role of Mayor definitely made me more comfortable that I started to play it on a near daily basis for the first year, especially to unwind after a long day of IRL work. Doing lots of chores, 
public works projects, interacting with the animal characters, and even visiting other people's towns in an online setting made this an even more enjoyable experience. Then at the end of 2016, the game got rebranded as Welcome Amiibo, as it gives you the ability to add new animal characters to your town with the ability to scan amiibo cards of those characters to your 3DS. It was a cool idea at first, but the ability to collect a lot of amiibo cards just wasn't for me and my enjoyment for the game slowly died from there. However, that doesn't take away the very enjoyable experience I had in the first couple years of this game's release. This is also the 3DS game I have spent the most hours playing with over 200. Anyways, that is Animal Crossing New Leaf, a 3DS game to seriously cozy up to. Number 5 Hyrule Warriors, released on Wii U September 26, 2014, then ported to Nintendo 3DS as Hyrule Warriors Legends March 25, 2016, and then ported to Nintendo Switch as Hyrule Warriors Definitive Edition May 18, 2018. Alrighty, one of the meatiest games on this list. Why is this game so meaty? It would probably take you the amount of time to eat prime rib to get an understanding of this. Just kidding. Let's get into this game already. I first saw its initial trailer in a December 2013 Nintendo Direct, which I felt really intrigued by as I had never even heard of the Warriors series games made by Koei Tecmo. This game is what I consider a major spin-off in the Zelda series, and although some people say this is canon to the franchise, I highly disagree as most of the gameplay has nothing to do with it. Anyways, the game's story mode starts off with a peaceful day in Hyrule until a big army of monsters come in and Zelda orders her guardsmen to protect the land. It's up to Link and many other characters to combat the monsters by using Warriors series tactics of hack and slash. So many Zelda franchise elements are built into this, such as fighting treasure chests with items and finding well-known bosses. Or, finding treasure chests with items and fighting well-known bosses. This game packs in a ton of characters from the history of the Zelda franchise that it just feels so good to play as them, when most were just primary NPCs in their prior games, such as Impa, Darunia, Rudo, Minna, and Girihi. Many new characters and modes would be added in the form of DLC, such as Tingle, Marin, and Ravio later on. Now for version differences, the Wii U one is absolutely the worst as it lacks what the later versions would greatly improve on. The 3DS version has great improvements, but its graphical and gameplay quality felt very lackluster, especially if played on an older 3DS model instead of a new 3DS. The improvements included switching characters on the fly, and warping to activated owl statues, which definitely were huge time savers to getting tasks done so fast. And it also added a side story centered around a girl named Linkle. The Switch version, which I've poured over 250 hours into at this point, is a better graphical and gameplay superior version of the 3DS port. It also added costumes from Breath of the Wild for Link and Zelda. Now for the real meat of this game, Alongside story mode, there are several adventure mode maps which I've spent maybe 90% of my total hours on as they're used to progress along as well as trying to unlock new characters and weapons for the characters. So that is Hyrule Warriors, a game that is as big as Prime Rib and that's no joke. Number 4 The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild released on Wii U and Nintendo Switch March 3rd, 2017. This game shouldn't need much explanation as it, it's right up there on many other lists for games of the decade. I'll start off by saying I was so sick and tired of all kinds of speculation and hype for it in the years leading up to its release that I just want to see for myself without all those so-called analysts dissecting all kinds of easter eggs for it. Anyways, the plot of this game involves Link's Awakening, from a 100 year slumber from Hyrule, as Hyrule was being destroyed very badly by Calamity Ganon, and it's up to him to rescue Zelda from Ganon's grasp. The biggest reason I've had this game so high on my list is for the massive overworld exploration, which I forgot how fun was when I first played Ocarina of Time. The paraglider item makes things much more enjoyable when I wanted to see what is above me and find some places to go explore. 
Another thing that makes this game shine are the mini dungeons called Shrines and the bigger dungeons called the Divine Beasts, which are inhabited by four characters that Zelda declares as champions. My two favorite champions are Daruk and Mifa, as they have personalities that really make you feel close to them. This game also comes with lots of side quests and various items to collect that I consider not as useful, but as a cool way to unwind from dealing with tough enemies or dungeons. And that is Zelda Breath of the Wild, a very massive Zelda game that seriously lets you do whatever the hell you want to do. Number 3 Super Mario 3D World, released on Wii U November 22nd, 2013. Some people may be shocked about this kind of ranking I have for this game, but it's just way too good. I seriously enjoy how this game lets me play as one of four, then later five characters in dozens of courses. Some of these courses also make me play them really fast that I like to challenge myself for how fast I can beat them. Anyways, instead of having to rescue Peach from Bowser's Grasp, you must rescue the Sprixies. Each course comes with a task of collecting green stars, which can be used to unlock more courses, stamps, which can be used to make Miiverse posts, although that is no longer a possibility as Miiverse was discontinued in 2017, and a goal of trying to reach the top of the flagpole at the end of the course. There's also some rapid-fire courses such as trying to defeat certain enemies or reaching green stars within 10 seconds. And this game includes Captain Toad courses, which played in the same way I mentioned earlier about the spin-off game on this list. And that is Super Mario 3D World, in my opinion the best Mario platformer of the decade. Number 2 Mario Kart 8, released on Wii U May 30th, 2014, then ported to Nintendo Switch as Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, April 28th, 2017. One of the first games I ever experienced a very enjoyable online mode for racing. Anyways, this has to be the most fun, high-tech Mario Kart game I've ever played in the history of the series. This game features several new courses as well as retro refurbished courses to race your customized character and vehicle combination. I don't have an ultimate favorite course as they're pretty much all really good. The game also packs in a few new characters such as the Koopalings, Baby Rosalina, and the weirdest addition, Pink Gold Peach. What separates these two versions is primarily character inclusions and battle modes. The Wii U version of battle modes is inarguably the worst as it makes you play the whole racing course itself to shoot your weapons, while the deluxe version lets you play on a more sandbox style course and in many different styles such as Coin Runners, bob -omb Blast, and others. Also, the deluxe version includes new characters such as the Inklings from Splatoon, King Boo, and Bowser Jr. The ability to include Labo support and local wireless play are also included in the deluxe version. And that's all I'll say about Mario Kart 8. Easily the best Mario Kart I've ever played until maybe the newest one sometime in the 2020s. Number 1 <laughs> The Splatoon series, first released on Wii U May 29th, 2015, then the sequel on Nintendo Switch July 21st, 2017. I'm not sure what people will say about this one, especially its ranking, but it has given me the most enjoyable experience from both an online and offline perspective. The first game is one I just wrote off between its unveiling at E3 2014 and a month after its release as I couldn't get a good understanding of how it plays until I saw plenty of videos about it. I'll start off discussing the Wii U version. The game involves playing a character known as an Inkling, who has to use a weapon to shoot ink onto the turf and quite simply have more of their color on the turf after time runs out. There's also other modes that don't have to involve inking the most turf, but rather more like combat style. The Wii U version story mode is one of the places where I started to get a bigger appreciation for the series more, as it has some involvement with the game's hostesses, known as the Squid Sisters, named Callie and Marie. The first game also had, for its first year, the events known as Splatfests, which had this atmosphere that reminded me of high school dances I went to, and they concluded with the ultimate one of Callie vs. Marie that felt like attending my senior year prom. That Splatfest also involved a big setup for the sequel. Now for the sequel. 
Most of the gameplay is exactly the same as the first, but with a few new modes including a newer story mode and a new set of hostesses called Off the Hook, named Pearl and Marina. Splatfests were also a theme for two years, including my most favorite of all, the Baseball vs. Soccer one. And it concluded with a Pearl vs. Marina Type 1 called Chaos vs. Order, which is presumably supposed to set up its possible third game in the series. The sequel also involves the first paid DLC called the Octo Expansion, which allows you to play a newer story mode as an Octoline, and after completing the story, allows you to play online matches as an Octoline. I found it to be just more variety and a great way to customize your playing experience. And that is the Splatoon series, and that concludes this list. Before we go, I'm gonna include a few more lists gaming related but without commentary. Hope you enjoy them and thanks for watching.